I love the fact that the medium, the digital medium, has allowed there to be more and more of that kind of content that's either serialized or occasional or uh, topical, mm -hmm. and it's so much more in the moment. Twitter. Yeah. Twitter beats Google. It beats news. It beats even, uh, you know, like recorded uh, like broadcasts, any kind of thing like that. It's there that second. Uh, we did a little experiment with uh, Major League Baseball, and uh, we were trying to figure out what can we do together. You own all of these different sources of data, and they kept saying, well, we sold that to this person, we sold that to this person. You know, But what they didn't do was they haven't successfully sold individuals publishing. So we were able to watch in real time uh, the Twitter feed of a baseball game uh, during spring training. And it was great live commentary by you know, probably 200 people. And the thing that's so interesting about that is you see in the beginning there are say 200 people at a game. Now you imagine you're at a game with uh, 5,000 people and you right. say, wow, that's too much. And then you're gonna say, I wanna follow uh, the, this, this 20 or 30 or 50 and you're back towards Building up some brands. Oh, that's interesting. Some people. So yeah, you know, that's the people you trust that are actually the people going you trust. Uh, yeah. You know, trust comes back. To, you know, brand a brand is a is a trust relationship, and you know I have all those people following me on Twitter because they think I'm going to give them good stuff, and they yeah. they kind of know what kinds of stuff I'm going to give them, and they're interested in my choices. Right. So back to curation, one of those core publishing values. I can see a lot of the big publishers, and you obviously don't represent them, although you're not small, uh, feeling so threatened by the millions of competitors suddenly. You know, mm -hmm. Everybody's a publisher. Uh, but it seems in so many respects it's complimentary. You know? it, it is because ultimately uh, there is a law of large numbers. Right. You cannot, no, no consumer can follow a million different sources, right? right. They're gonna, it's gonna come down to a funnel somewhere. 10 years from now, I expect augmented reality is gonna be fairly widespread. Yeah. Our, our applications know where we are, uh, they'll know a lot about us. Uh, we're gonna have a pretty interesting set of opportunities for situational publishing. You're in this kind of location, what kinds of things would enhance your experience in that location? And again, some of this might not normally be classed as publishing, but certainly it fits into you know, certain categories, travel guides, uh, restaurant guides. You know, I'm here, show me good food around here. That's a job that used to be done by, publisher. by a publisher. And there's no reason why publishers shouldn't be building apps like that. I mean, I think that's a really important uh, concept, I think, for publishers to get their brains around. What they own and control is a database of content, and they need to have a flexible set of services against that database. Yeah. And, you know, a really good example of this, uh, one I like to talk about, is uh, a guy named Mitch Waite, used to be one of my competitors uh, in the computer book business, and he went on and he started a website called uh, whatbird.com. Whatbird is a bird identification guide. And it, it kind of gave you a decision tree to figure out exactly what bird it was you saw. He now has an iPhone app, and it does things like uh, you hear the bird song, you hold it up, the app listens and says, "Oh yeah, that's a you know yellow-throated warbler or something." I don't, I, I don't know if such thing exists, <laughs> but but I love you know that sense of possibilities that the sensor platform you know informs the book, and we've taken something that used to be a book and is now. Uh, something much richer and more capable. Yeah. Aaron McKean of uh, Wordnik, which is an online dictionary, uh, you know, gave a wonderful talk at one of our conferences called Dictionaries and Other Book-Shaped Objects. You know, just reminding us that you know, things like a dictionary, an atlas, they only looked like books because we didn't have a better form for them. Oh, you had it. And, and, yeah, and in fact, you know, a dictionary is way better as a search engine. Uh, you know, a, a, an atlas is way better as, you know, Google Maps on your iPhone. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, and this is to your point, I think 10 years from now, the overlaps and the connections are going to be more important than the content itself. It's going to be the relationships that are drawn mm -hmm. more than it's going to be, you know, the fact that it's a, a, a beautifully rendered version of that bird. Mm -hmm. So where you are, who you are, uh, what you're currently thinking about, what you care about, who else around you cares mm -hmm. about those things, 
all of those overlapping connections are going to determine uh, what you're looking at. Uh, and that's just going to be constantly dynamically changing. Yeah, and I, I think, though, there is still going to be a role for selection. Uh, and whether that selection is done you know, in the old style of curation or mm-hmm. new tools for crowdsource curation or uh, whether it will be... Um, you know, some complex algorithm that takes into account all kinds of personalization factors or whatever, there still is a need to select out of the universe of everything that might matter to help guide you towards the thing that does matter. You could argue that that is the future of publishing, that it's that curatorial role or that guiding or focusing role, and that there are certain people who have historically been better at it and may not end up being exactly the same people because there might not be the same controls or channels, but people like you will help people like me wade through that forest of information and say, this is probably more valuable than this. Yeah, and and I think it will get paid for. Yeah. It will get paid for. One of the things I find really wonderful and very encouraging in just the last couple of years, and iPhone gets a lot of credit for this, is people are starting to go back to feel comfortable paying for things that were originally classified as sort of ephemeral or digital, you know, the mm-hmm. things that you couldn't touch and hold and wrap and send, and that's very encouraging. So. Yeah, and th- th- there is a lot more comfort with with buying intangibles now than there was yeah. even a few years ago. Yeah, exactly. I also think people shouldn't uh, uh, ignore subscription yeah. as a business model. You know, we already, you know, in fact, you know, this is, is one of the big, you know, Again, one of these things that's so obvious, but people just don't seem to think about it. Uh, internet has never been free. It's, it's a subscription business. Everybody pays their ISP. It's just you know the content providers didn't end up participating in that uh, information stream. Right. That's one of the reasons why with Safari Books Online we went for a subscription model because we said, hey, look, if you look at cable TV, you look at uh, you know cell phones, they're basically bought by subscription a lot. Yeah. And you 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 you, you pay. Uh, you know, a certain for either a certain amount of usage, or maybe you pay more for all you can eat. There's a variety of, of models that that's really a monthly prepay. And uh, again, one more business model that I'm surprised that more people aren't uh, taking advantage of. I have a little alert on my calendar to remind me to take my two books yeah. <laughs> before they uh, pass away. Yeah. So the good news in this conversation is that there is a future. For yeah. publishing, That's, I think it's a bright future. Yeah. Uh, it's just a future that uh, we're working towards. Right. 